Позвольте мне представить эксперта Маргарет Скойнидж. Это в настоящее время она является профессором антропологии Калифорнийского университета. И хочу оговориться, что опять-таки в рамках или под эгидой фестиваля на науке одним из организаторов приезда ученых является школа Репная и также помогает ей в этом проекте открытое пространство. Мы рады вас здесь сегодня видеть и надеемся на то, что э, вы получите удовольствие от замечательной лекции. И также, пользуясь случаем, хочу э, сделать небольшой анонс и сказать, что в конце э, э, октября школа Репная приглашает вас и ждет на фестиваль научно актуального кино. Следите за рекламой. Спасибо. Well, I'd like to start by thanking the uh, people who invited me. This is my first trip to Russia, and my first trip, obviously, to Voronezh. And I enjoyed myself very much, and I hope I can give you something you enjoy tonight as well. The title of my lecture is Food Fueled Human Evolution. And the point of it is, I, what I hope to do is walk you through a little bit of how I believe food interacted with our evolution throughout our whole history, the whole history of our lineage. And I'm going to finish by talking very briefly about what I think how it's affecting us today. So I hope um, to give you something of interest. First of all, I want to start with why study diet, why focus on that, as opposed to so many other aspects, sociality, psychology, brain size increase that one could do if you were interested in studying human evolution. And in my opinion, I think it's because food is so basic for survival of any individual and of any species. And so as an individual, you have to have food in order to stay alive long enough in order to reproduce or else your genes do not go into the next generation, which is what evolution is all about. It's also because Food is necessary to maintain pregnancy, lactation, and then feed the child after the child is born. As you probably are quite aware, we have one of the most dependent young of any species, and it takes a lot of energy invested over a lot of years in order to make, bring a child to the point where they themselves are going to be reproducing. And so in order for a species to exist, not just the individual to exist, but for the species to exist, there has to be food that allows that process to take place and allows the female and allows, in, at least in humans, it allows the father to also invest into the offspring and at least in some such societies, it's very clearly in the form of food. The last is that food basically provided the energy that allowed the increase in brain size in humans. And the brain takes up an enormous amount of our energy. Relative to body size, it takes up more of our energy than it does in any other species. And it had to be food that allowed that process to happen. And so all of the things that I think that are important about human evolution can be tied back into the food that provided the energy that allowed these things to happen. So what I'm going to do is look a little bit at um, the whole sequence of human evolution from what must have been the, the change to an ape-like creature from a monkey-like creature. When I say that, I don't mean that it's a monkey evolved from ape, I, because the monkeys we see today are not ancestrals to the apes we see today. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened between the ape-like creatures and how we separated from them. And again, I want to emphasize it is not as if we have an ape as an ancestor. We and the apes shared an ancestor, and so I'm not trying to propose that there's a, a ladder of evolution. And then I'm going to go a little bit more into more, hum, more modern members of our lineage. So the first question I want to ask is, is there a natural diet for primates? And that includes humans. So is there something we should be eating? And I think, there are a lot of people asking that question right now because so many of modern diseases seem to be tied to poor diets. And so I'm just looking here across the primates and trying to ask the question, 
are there common themes that we might see and what are those themes? And then can we tie that to humans and try to understand how those aspects might have influenced our evolution? So what I'm showing you here is are some prosimians. Those are the ones that are not even monkeys. And then new world monkeys, old world monkeys, and then the beginning of the apes in terms of three of the apes that are not as closely related to us. And then finally the chimpanzee, which is our closest living relative. And that's a long way from being our closest relative. So I'm going to talk about some major dietary transitions in which I think we distinguished ourselves and why we are the dominant species on this planet and why other primates are not and why other species have been basically virtually wiped out because of ourselves. So what I'm going to talk first about is the ancestral humans versus the ancestral apes. And why is it, I ask the question of why is it we are not apes? And I think the simple answer is that we lost out in terms of the competition of where to live. Basically the apes got the good stuff, we got the bad stuff, and yet we ended up doing far better than the apes today. Then I'm going to talk about Homo erectus and how Homo erectus became separate from those early ape-like creatures. Why is it that our genus move forward and other species did not. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about out of Africa, across the globe, and agriculture, because agriculture was a major dietary transition for us. And I'm going to end with a little bit about what's going on today in terms of transitions in humans. And I would say another major dietary transition is the industrialization of food processing. And I won't be going into this in any great detail, but I will be talking about it in terms of its overall impact in terms of modern human society and also modern human evolution. So diet. I want to speak very clearly about what I mean when I'm talking about diet. I have students who want to know about probiotics. I have students who want to know about what vitamins and minerals they should take. I have students who are asking me whether they should be vegan, whether they should be macrobiotic, whether they should be straight vegetarian, whether they should be ovo-lacto vegetarian, or whether we really are omnivores who are supposed to eat meat. And I, right now, there's been a lot of concern about how much meat we should eat and should we eat meat at all. And I'm not talking about the social aspects of this now, I'm talking about only the nutritional aspects. I think that there are great social aspects in terms of eating meat, and that's something I like to talk about, but that's not appropriate for this venue. So basically, I break down diet into two major categories. One is energy, and as I said, energy underwrites the rise in large brain size, and energy underwrites almost everything else we do. There are two major sources of energy. One is fat and the other is carbohydrate. Carbohydrate, for the most part, is easier to digest than fat. So although we store fat, so if we eat excess calories, we store it as fat. Mobilizing that fat is not as easy energetically as it is for you just to be able to take some carbohydrate and get a quick burst of energy. So the way that the early nutritionists said, used to talk about it is that Fat, lipid, burns in the flame of carbohydrate. It takes carbohydrate to give the energy to use the lipid. There are three components to carbohydrate, which I think are critical in considering diet. And I'll go through those in just a second. The other major aspect is protein. Basically, it's just because if you're going to grow, if you are going to turn over tissue, if you are going to have a child, feed a child who's then going to grow, you have to have protein. We are proteins. Our hair is a protein. Our fingernails are proteins. Our muscles are proteins. Virtually all of our organs are proteins. The things that catalyze reactions in our bodies are proteins. So you have to have protein in order to be able to do just basic functioning, including just your basic metabolism. But let's look a little bit at the energy source from carbohydrate. You can't read this, and I'm not expecting you to. But when I, the point here is if you look at that, and just in general, you have three different sugars showing up there. And they are simple compounds. 
And sugar is basically one of those things that if you take it, it goes immediately across your gut wall and it gives you instant energy. Starch, the only thing I want you to notice here is that the connections between those aspects. Starch takes a little bit more to digest, but you begin digesting starch in your mouth. So the saliva in your mouth has an enzyme that begins to break down the bonds in starch. And so by the time it gets to your stomach, you've already begun to break it down. And by the time it gets to your small intestine, which follows the stomach, you are already able to absorb energy from starch. The last one is fiber. Fiber is indigestible in our guts. So in a human gastrointestinal tract, you cannot digest fiber. So if you eat celery, for example, I'm trying to think of what else would be of high fiber content in your diets, but I think we all know what celery is. So you know the stringy things in celery, that, that's fiber, and you cannot digest that. So what happens is that it goes into your stomach, small intestine, and your large intestine, and you carry microbiota, organisms, microorganisms, that then will ferment that fiber. But it's a slow process. The microorganisms are there for their own energy. They're not there to help you. And so you get basically half the energy out of it that could be fermented from it. And I, that is absolutely critical, I think, in terms of human evolution. So trends across all primates. There are some general trends. One of them is that there is an association, I would say a correlation, between primate foods and primate body sizes. There are certain foods that small primates can eat, and there are certain foods that only large primates can eat. And there are very good reasons for that. Small primates can focus on insects. And that's because, unless it's a socializing insect, so a social insect like bees or Every now and then grasshoppers social, move in social groups. But if you don't have a mass of insects, a large animal cannot survive on insects, unless you have a major biological adaptation, like an anteater. So someone of our body size could not survive on insects. You just don't come across enough. So it's not just the yuck factor of insects. You know, because some people don't like the idea of insects. I'm one of them, by the way. Um, but in my, to south of me, in Mexico, people eat a lot of insects, and they are tasty, um, the few that I've had. <laughs> but we cannot survive on insects because you just can't get enough of them. So for a small primate, they're very high in protein, and they're easy to digest, which means that you get a fair amount of energy. They're mostly lipid, but you get a lot of energy. If you are a large primate, like a gorilla, so over 200 pounds, you can't get enough insects. And so what they eat are leaves. Now leaves are very hard to digest because it's all like celery. And so what they do is they basically sit and ferment for hours. And apparently, those people who study gorillas can actually locate them in the forest by the methane that they are excreting as they metabolize the fiber. In fact, this is just an aside, but cows who do a lot of fermentation actually would probably put as much methane into the atmosphere as a lot of other things that humans can do. So by growing, having so many cattle, we actually put a lot of methane. And that's what happens with um, leaves being. Then you get a large range of primates. In fact, most primates, with the exception of some very small primates, who can take fruit in as energy. And I had some fruit drink before I came here, and it, I can really feel the difference. I mean, you take fruit, and fruit has a lot of sugar in it. It's fructose, it's not your table sugar. But you can eat that fruit, and it gives you instant energy. And so what most primates do is take fruit, which is high in energy, and then they combine it with either leaves as protein or insects as protein. And small primates can do the insects, and the larger primates do the leaves. 
What you don't do is eat insects and leaves because your gut, your gastrointestinal tract is set up to do one or the other. You can't stuff a little tiny, that's a microcebus, that thing is a little lemur, and that's a finger, a human finger, and it will sit in the palm of a hand. It's less than 100 grams. These things are really tiny. So they can get the, the basically, the insects, but they can't get enough leaves in their gut in order to be able to get enough energy. So this is something to keep in mind in terms of our body size, where would we fall on that triangle? This is something too. So if you're going to have an exception to those general rules, it has to, you have to have something special. It isn't just a matter of, I've decided I'm going to eat insects. It's a matter of doing something special. So I've given you three examples up here, and I want to walk you through them. The I.I. is a prosimian in Madagascar. It is too large to be an insect eater, and yet it focuses only on insects. And the, what it has done is two different biological adaptations, which is due to natural selection. It didn't choose to do these things. If you look at that bottom photograph on the left, you'll see that there's one very skinny finger on that hand. That's its hand. And that skinny finger is used to tap in across bark of a tree. And it can then wedge underneath the bark and flip it up and get at an insect. Those big ears that it has are actually mobile, unlike most primates. They can move their ears to actually hear insects under bark. So those are two major adaptations. They are the woodpecker of the primate world in terms of being large primates. The second one is called a lepi lemur, and it's a very tiny primate, but it eats leaves. So how can a tiny primate, when I've told you they can't get enough leaves, actually do it? And what these animals do is they go into torpor daily. That means they go into a hole in the tree, like the lower picture is showing, goes into a hole in the tree, and it basically so it slows its metabolic rate down to the point where the food can move through, the microorganisms can function, and it will get energy out of those leaves. So what that means is this animal is not doing very much. It's eating, sort of like a koala. A koalas are cute little things, but they don't do much. You sit there and watch them, and they just, they don't do very much. This last one is a bamboo lemur, and it can ingest enough cyanide, in fact, 12 times the cyanide it would take to kill you. And these are small. And again, what they do is they go into torpor, and apparently, they also have some genetic adaptations that allow them to eat it. We have those major adaptations. We're sort of a general primate. And so how we ended up eating what we did, we didn't do it by having some really major biological adaptations, unless you count bipedalism, because we are odd that way. So if we look at this in another way, what you see on the left are small primates, and what you see on the right are large primates. And insectivores fall to the left, small primates, and folivores, leaf eaters, fall to the right. And frugivores, fruit eaters that are either eating leaves or insects, are falling across the, the um, range, and you get the sort of larger frugivores eating, larger fruit eaters eating leaves. So where do our ancestors fall? We fall in the leaf fruit eating category. We don't eat leaves. So what did we do that was different than what the apes did? Because the apes eat leaves and fruit. There's another general trend, and that is that food affects activity levels. So if you're sitting around in a forest fermenting fiber most of the day, you are not interacting with any other primate. In order to be able to interact, you have to have quick energy. So the difference here is between two apes. The red is the chimpanzee, the blue is the gorilla. And you can see right away that the chimpanzee is eating far more fruit than the gorilla. And as you get down to things that have a high fiber content, like leaves and bark, the gorilla is eating far more than the chimpanzee. 
and the behavioral adaptation or the behavior is quite different. So let me just show you some quick videos of the two primates. This is obviously a gorilla and it is sitting and eating sedges and it's rinsing the dirt off, very good, rinsing the dirt off so he's not taking all the dirt out of it. This is a relatively young and so you can see the sedge. That is like nothing you could ever imagine eating. It's like eating grass. But the other point that I want to make is how little interaction there is going on between animals. And so that animal is sitting there in a group, but it is not interacting with a group. It's basically eating. And then it's going to sit and ferment. And so there's very little socialization. There's the baby sitting on his mother's back. And again, there's no interaction between the two. They're not playing with each other. It's just that the baby couldn't sit there in the sedge itself. So it's actually sitting on mom's back. And here are two juveniles, and they're sitting there eating, but they're not interacting. If you look at this is a chimpanzee, it is somewhat more active. What that chimpanzee is doing is making a, a termite or ant fishing tool and it's going into a termite mound and taking out termites. And those termites apparently give it some very important minerals. The calories are not great. But that, that's a juvenile that's actually eating those. And they take them a while to learn how to do that. This is a mother and she has a baby on the back. In fact, I think she has two babies. There's one on the right, our, to our right, and one on the left. So she's using a lot of energy to do that. And she's pulling up out of the termite now. And she's moving faster. And she does move faster than what happened with the gorillas. And yet, think about how we interact. We interact at a far higher level than either one of those do. I mean, I'm interacting with you just by looking at you. You're probably interacting with each other. Anybody who might have a cell phone out there is probably having to keep in track. I don't know how you guys do it. You manage to keep all this together. I watch my stepson who can handle his cell phone, his iPad, and his TV, and his computer all at the same time. And then he can interact with me, going, Margaret, I just found something I think would be really good for you. And so there's all this interaction that's going on. Very different. So I think humans are major exceptions. We have the body size of a leaf eating and fruit eating category. We're not leaf eaters. Humans do not eat large quantities of indigestible fiber. If you look at our GI tract, gastrointestinal tract, relative to the chimpanzee and the gorilla, we are really different in that we have roughly the same stomachs, but our small intestine is much larger, our large intestine is much smaller. That means our fermentation vat is much smaller, our absorption vat is much larger. And we spend a lot of time socializing. So let's start with the humans and the ancestral journey. And I want to talk to you a little bit about what they ate, which I think made the difference between what happened to the apes and what happened to us. And I'm gonna begin with what is probably the earliest human ancestor, it is called Artipithecus ramidus. It is 4.5 million years ago, oh, from 4.5 million years ago, which is close to the time of separation of the apes. It was found in Ethiopia. I was fortunate enough to see her last summer. It is a she. The pelvis is there, complete enough to be able to sex her. On the left is a picture of the skeleton laid out in a display case. And on the right is an artist's reconstruction of her. She stood upright. She used trees, but that foot and that hip allowed her to stand upright and she could extend her knees. Her hands are not like yours. Her fingers are much longer than yours, but she, so she did use the trees, but it was quite different even then than an ape. So what did she eat? This, the picture I'm showing you, is the kind of area in which her fossil bones were found. There are no primates that live in that area today, unless they're humans and they dig wells. So the only primates are humans who dig wells. So she probably did not live in that kind of environment, so what did she live in? How do you get at that? 
you know, 4.5 million years ago, there are not a lot of seeds hanging around from 4.5 million years ago. So how do you know where she lived and what she had available to her? What you do is you use her chemistry. What we're looking at is an atmosphere, air, and we're looking, going to look at the carbon in that atmosphere. And carbon, as you may know, comes in more than one form. They're both stable. This is not radioactive. They're both stable. They come in the form of carbon-13 and carbon-12. And we present them as a delta-13C up there. So you're going to see delta values, but it's just a matter of how we represent it. Atmospheric CO2 is made up of 13CO2 and 12CO2. And it makes no difference in terms of chemical reactions. The carbon sits in exactly the same place, but the rate of reaction changes. And 13C, being heavier, reacts more slowly. And so what happens is as you go through a biosphere, through a trophic system, you get major changes in the ratio of 13C to 12C. And using those changes, those known changes, you can actually tell what kind of food an animal ate. And if I were to, well, I'll tell you in a second. So what happens is plants take up CO2. And there are two trees on your left, and there are grasses on your right. They take them up differently. And if you were to look at a delta C13 value, the tree on the far left is going to be about minus 26. The one in the middle is going to be minus 22 and the grass is going to be around minus 12. So if you just took a piece of plant, you can analyze it and tell what, it's, what it is like, whether it's a dry grass, whether it's a tree. Even if you couldn't identify it, you could tell. Animals then eat those plants, and what you have on your left is a gazelle, and it is a leaf eater. The one on your right is a goat, goat type. It's an ibex, and it eats grass. And the difference is that that difference between the plants gets taken up by the, the um, animals. So the far left gazelle is feeding on those, that forest leaf, and it comes out to be about minus 12. The gazelle that's sort of in the middle is feeding in an open environment, and it's coming out to be about minus 8. And the goat all the way over on the far is coming out about 0. So if you want to know what an animal ate, you'd actually analyze its tissue to see what it looks like. And I suspect that my tissues are quite different from your tissues. Because in my country, we eat a lot of corn. And even if I don't know I'm eating corn, I'm eating corn because it's in virtually everything I eat. And, and most of the animals I eat are also eating corn, and so I will look like that goat. You, on the other hand, you may be eating some corn, but I suspect you're eating mostly other kinds of cool weather grasses, and you are going to look more like the antelope on the left. In fact, just to give you a slight aside, in the United States, we eat more corn than they do in Mesoamerica. We, we look cornier than Mesoamericanists, and that's because we eat it in everything, the animals we eat as well as the plants we eat. Well, in the late 1990s, I did a series of studies looking to see if primates did the same thing. So I took primates from savanna woodlands, and I, I did a, several different kinds, but I'm just focusing here on chimpanzee. I took them from savanna woodlands, which is like that area that the, uh, the one, the two gazelles. The gallery forest, which is the gazelle that ate the low, ended up with the lowest number, and I looked at them in gallery forest. And I showed that from the Savannah Woodland, they were minus 9. From the Gallery Forest, they were minus 10. And from the canopy, closed canopy forest, they were minus 12. And the numbers don't matter. It's just a matter of you can tell where those animals were from. It's good because if you've got chimpanzee coats from somewhere you don't even know where they were from, you can actually do the analysis on them and tell whether they came from a, a pristine forest or some kind of disturbed forest, if you're a museum person. So here we go, here's Artipithecus, and Artipithecus falls right at minus 10. And 
it is living in a savanna woodland. Now, savanna woodland today is extremely marginal for chimpanzees. They are terrified of being there. And the only reason they are there is because humans have pushed them into very marginal environments. So they live in very large groups, and they move in ways that allow them to avoid predators, humans. Humans are the major predator. So this is apparently not a place that's very marginal for our ancestors, and that's what I mean. We lost out to the apes. So our preferred environment is either a woodland or a forest, and we ended up getting the savanna woodland. But I think we did a pretty good job with it. So here is the Artipithecus again, and you just see her standing upright in a little drawing down below. And what you see on the right-hand side are the kinds of trees that grow in savanna woodlands. And they are what we call leguminous trees. They're a bean-like tree. And so they have a lot of protein. They um, can chew very mature seeds because they have very thick teeth. And they can extract fat. Most primates are not eating fat except for the really tiny insects that eat, uh, the really tiny primates that eat insects. The fat is not our major food. So what we have is already a change between our lineage and the lineage that resolved in apes, and that is that we were eating lipid fat, and we were eating it in trees, probably tree seeds, and getting a lot of protein. And of course we ate food. So, Let's look at the next ones. You, you've probably heard of these. These are Australopithecus, Australopithecines. There are a lot of them. We originally thought they were our ancestors because they walked upright. And so now I want to think through that a little bit more. This is two Australopithecines up at the top left compared to the Homo sapiens. Some of them were as large as we are in terms of height, but their body shape was completely different. Whereas you stand upright and you have ribs that are sort of barrel shaped because you don't have very much gastrointestinal tract. The Australopithecines flared because they had so much hind gut, and so much colon because they were doing so much fermentation. A very different adaptation than we are. They were found largely in South Africa, that's why I'm showing them that. So I show this cartoon, it's called bipedalism. I got the idea from a bird because birds are about the only other animals that walk upright. Kangaroos, some marsupials, but we're the only mammal that walks upright for any length of time. There are some that'll get upright. My dog actually will jump upright, but she's not very comfortable doing it. So the reason we thought they were our close ancestors is because they walk like us and no other primate walks like us. But when we start looking at their diet, we might want to begin rethinking that. The two in the top left are reconstructions, artist reconstructions, of both the robust and the grasshopper australopithecus. The skull in the bottom right is what their skulls look like, and that thing on the top of the head is there because there was muscle that went all the way up across the top of their head that were chewing muscles. They were massive chewing machines. Their teeth had enamel that looked like they were eating grass. So what is it? They could either be eating grass, or they could be eating an animal feeding on grass, because it all looks the same. But if you look at those teeth compared to a modern human, so what I have on the, br the brown one is the oscopithecine, the white one is a modern human. I tried to line them up so the molars are comparable. And those Australopithecine molars, their back teeth, are about two to three times the size of ours. So they have, not only did they have a very large fermentation vat, but they had a very large grinding apparatus in their mouths, which allowed them. And the chances that they were feeding on an animal are virtually nil. They aren't set up to go after an animal. As far as we know, they had no tools. I think they were like this. This is an old reconstruction of them. In fact, it's probably from the 1970s. But I'm starting to rethink this. I'm thinking that 
Any large-bodied primate like that who looks that grass-like has to be doing something like this. And that's not doing a lot of socializing and basically feeding and fermenting. Our ancestors weren't like that. So what we have here, and I don't know what went on between our Epithecus and, and above, the ones in sort of the light turquoise, it's not clear what they were doing. The ones I have in the box now are early members of our genus, Homo. And we're Homo sapiens, they were called Homo erectus. They had thin enamel on their teeth, they had smaller molars than the Australopithecines, and they were of our body size. This was an incredible find. I was actually in uh, Kenya at the time this was found, and I was fortunate enough to fly in and fly out with a National Geographic photographer, and so he was taking pictures of the skeleton as it came out. Um, this, the one in the middle there is an artist's reconstruction. It was a boy. He was not fully formed yet. Um, probably in his teens when he died. Um, but what we find is that at maturity, if you do the calculations, his brain size was at the low end of our brain size. So not quite at our average, but definitely into the modern human size, at the low end, about 1200 cc. The other thing, though, is about this time, we start finding cutting tools, digging and cutting tools. So Homo erectus has the same exact carbon value as the Australopithecines, but it's far more likely that what they were doing is using tools to scavenge, and they actually had tools, probably wooden tools that we're no longer finding, and they were getting meat. And for me, the most significant part about getting meat is that you can break open a bone, get the lipid out of the bone, and you can feed it to a baby. And when you think about feeding a baby grass, it's the same problem as a small primate. They're too tiny to be able to give them something as rough as grass. But you can't put enough in their guts to be able to give them the nourishment they need. So unless you're going to nurse for four to five years, you're not going to be able to raise a baby on grass. And even at five years, it's unlikely that a child could eat a lot of grass. So I think the significant issue here is not only that humans were feeding on lipids, but they were able to give it to babies, which allowed the energy to grow the brain. I don't think there was much selection on brain size. The way brains grew, it was like 100 cc, every 100,000 years, that's hardly adaptation, i.e. natural selection. But if you give energy, you can grow. And so the argument is that energy was available to the mother, the mother then was able to give energy to the child, and you could have brain size. As increase in brain size is sort of a secondary adaptation. So to summarize, I think there is a basic primate biology physiology. I think it is a focus on ease of energy extraction. That baboon up in the top left is taking a, a puncha, a cactus fruit. Those are not native. They came into Kenya probably about 30 years ago, and the baboons have already learned how to take those cactus fruits, roll them around in the dirt, get the thorns off so that they can actually feed on them, and they are pure sugar. And the girl down in the bottom was, of course, doing what a lot of humans do, which is go after the sweet um, carbohydrate that will give her a lot of energy. So in other words, humans are exceptions in the way we add lipids and fats, the addition of vertebrate meat, and processing, which is what the baboon is doing at a very low level, and then culture, which I won't go into much. So I now want to talk about quickly how to move out of Africa and how to move out of the globe, across the globe. So as we moved, our ancestors about 200,000 years ago moved out of Africa. What was safe to eat? An animal's safe to eat because it's meat. It's just like we are. If you could cook, then you could actually eat a plant because you could detoxify the plant. The thing that will kill you if you move into a new area is not meat, it's going to be the plants. Because the plants can't move and they protect themselves by putting toxins. 
So there are often toxins in undomesticated plants. For example, potato, which you eat a lot of, and I do too, the undomesticated potato is poisonous. And what the earliest humans did in order to eat those potatoes is they did two things. One, they dipped them in clay, which was like taking kaopectate or some kind of soothing material for the gut. They would eat them and the clay would chelate the toxin or they would freeze dry them, which ruptured the cell walls and released the toxin. And so humans processed in order to eat these things. And so in order to eat some of these plants, cooking was almost was absolutely necessary. And then because we have learned how to do that, probably by a lot of people dying as they learned the hard way or as their relatives learned the hard way that you couldn't eat that plant. Uh, agriculture, plants became staples. And the only difference is that we now control the reproduction of the plant. And as some people have argued, the plants are now controlling us to help their reproduction. So if you think about how successful corn is, corn has co-opted us to advance its reproduction. It's almost taken over the planet as much as we have. So in China, you had millets and rice in the Fertile Crescent and then went up into Europe and into these regions, actually. You have wheats and barleys. And in South America, <clears throat> in the highlands and in, Meso in South America, you actually have potatoes. And in Mesoamerica, you have corn, beans, and squash. Those are all very different foods, but the things that are very common is that they are all starch. So the staple is a starch, and it is processed in a way that allows you to access the starch very, very easily. So whether the food is different or not, the components of the food in terms of the protein and in terms of the lipid and in terms of the carbohydrate are very much the same. So in corn, beans, and squash, you have beans for protein. In South America, with potatoes, they actually had yama, which they ate an animal. In um, China, you got a little bit of fish or a little bit of meat. You had soy products. And in uh, the Fertile Crescent, you could eat your wheats and barleys, and you had goats. They were originally domesticated goats. So you added your protein to your starch. Another thing, though, that was happening is that we began this grain processing, which allowed the breakdown of these plants so that we could utilize them, so we could eat the thing that the Australopithecine ate, but we're not spending all the time chewing and we're not spending all the time fermenting. And I'm just showing you wheat, various different kinds of millets, and corn on the bottom, and a grinding stone up in your top right. What that did is wear down the teeth so that basically you lost your teeth by the time you were about 25. <laughs> so you better get your reproduction over with pretty quickly or else have someone else take care of your kids. By the 19th century, and I just, I love this picture, so that's why I picked it, but it was happening everywhere. You started having another kind of processing, which is you use water or draft animals in order to grind. So you're no longer expending the energy to grind, you're actually processing by having something else do the grinding for you. So it was less energy expenditure in order to get probably more energy out. We took it even farther in the late 1800s with steel rollers and we milled the wheat. And when we do that, we actually strip away any, basically any fiber at all. And so you get pure starch. You squeeze the endosperm out, which is the protein. You take the germ and the fat, you sieve that off and what you have is straight starch. It quickly provides energy, and at least today, it's quickly providing excess energy, which we then store as fat. Another, I said sugars, the primates really like sugars, but originally, the sugars, which in North America is maple syrup, and also honeys, in the old world, in Europe, and in Africa, the main sugary thing was honey. Those are only available seasonally. So at the bottom is a group of hunter-gatherers I worked with in Tanzania. And the man has cut open a tree limb, and she has her arm up in there to grab honey that's put in by stingless bees. She doesn't go after bees that sting. 
They'll take the larva, which gives them protein, and they'll take the honey. But again, it's only a seasonal thing. But in northern India, in 500 BC, they began making crystalline sugar, and it changed the face of Europe as it began to be traded. In fact, sugar was one of the reasons why the Europeans tried to get to India, was to be able to get that product. And it was highly valued. And when it came to the United States, it also really took off in both Europe and then in the US. So I'm just showing you now a graph, graph of sugar consumption in the United States. I don't have it for Russia. We tend to keep these things, and I couldn't get into your literature because I don't speak Russian or read it. But in 1909, you'll see that it was rather low. And by 1990 to 1999, it had grown by about a third, almost to a half. There are dips in there, and those dips are the world wars. So between, in 1919, at the end of the, in the teens, it, there was a dip, and then it went back up. And then in 1940-45, it also dropped down uh, in the U.S., and then it climbed almost consistently. But we did even better. So in the late 1970s, we did something called, and it's off the screen, ion exclusion chromatography. And I just learned today that there was a Russian who actually developed some of these chromatographic techniques. Um, what that allowed them to do was to get high fructose corn syrup. And I don't know if that's, this has invaded your food supply or not. Because again, I can't read Russian, but I can tell you that virtually every piece of bread that is made in the United States has high fructose corn syrup in it. So I have to look or else make my own bread in order to avoid this stuff. So what it did is it took cornstarch, which people couldn't figure out what to do with, and they made sugar out of it. And what up on the top, the gray bar parts of the bars are high fructose corn syrup and the increase in the use. And the green bars are all sort of normal sugars, sucrose. And what you'll see, I think, is that high fructose corn syrup has taken over in terms of sucrose, and it is even more easily digestible than sucrose. And so it is, to me, it's the evil, lurking evil that I try to avoid in my own diet. Well, that, those sugars are linked to several diseases. We call it syndrome X. And syndrome X are people who have type 2 diabetes, and we're starting to see type 2 diabetes in children, particularly in the South, in the United States. So there are children who, by the age of 8 or 10, have type 2 diabetes. It used to be called adult onset diabetes. And they have a shorter lifespan than I do. Their predicted lifespan is less than mine was. And so that goes along with uh, coronary heart disease. It goes along with hypertension. It goes along with gout. And it goes along with obesity. And I don't know how many of you have visited the United States, but you will notice a major change difference in the population if you step off the plane. You probably did in the Midwest. It's even worse now. You step off a plane, go into Cleveland, and you're going to see people walking around who have legs that are bright red because they are having diabetic sores. And it's a lot because of this. So when you look at the amount of sugar down there in what is now a normal serving of Coca-Cola on the right, it's hard to get the small cans anymore. You're taking in that much sugar. And of course, all those other things have high fructose corn syrup or sugar in them. And people are eating them all the time. The other issue is that we have processed to the point where we are producing very cheap meat, at least in my country, very cheaply. And we're doing it by doing it on factory farms. And we're doing these factory farms, and we're giving them excess corn. No cow was ever set up to eat corn. It is not good for them. But it puts a lot of fat in their meat, and it makes it very tender. And so people buy it. And again, it's cheap, because you're growing them on factory farms. They're just living there. They're not on pasture. Um, when you look at those meats, you will see that they are very fat. We know salami is fat. That's not too surprising. We can see it. Salami is 74% fat. But you look at our ground beef, and I'm not sure about your ground beef, but the ones in the United States are about 64% fat. And I know many of my friends are buying ground turkey because that's supposed to be so much better. 
But the ground turkey is from leg meat and it has fat in it and they grind up fat so that you can cook it and it probably has about as much fat in it as the ground beef, so you're not getting very much. Hot dogs, that's off the screen, but it's almost 82% um, fat. Pork ribs, we eat that on the 4th of July in the other time, 72% fat. And a T-bone steak, which comes looking just like that, and there are people who will sit down and eat a pound and a half of that. I have trouble buying a steak at my local grocery store that is less than a pound. So my husband and I now split steaks so we can get a half a pound of steak. And that's going to be a lot of fat. So you're getting a lot of energy from fat and a lot of energy from sugars. The other processing I'll just go over very quickly. We have portable steel expellers to be able to get vegetable oil out of things we never ate before. And so we're getting it out of cottonseed oil. We're taking cottonseed. No one ever ate cottonseed before. We're getting cottonseed oil. We're getting um, uh, canola oil, which are also very tiny seeds. And we're eating a lot of it. And the way it's produced, at least in terms of Crisco, is it makes a trans fat which is, has been tied very closely to um, problems of uh, cancers and also heart diseases. So this is just an overall graph with the red showing you total vegetable oils because before we had these easy processing of vegetable oil, you basically had beef tallow. I was fortunate enough to have a student in my class last year who likes to make her own clean lard out of beef fat. And I asked her, well, how much of it do you use? She said, well, not very much because it takes me so much to be able to produce it. So the production of the fat from an animal takes a homemaker a lot more time than it does to go into the store and buy the canola oil. And then you sprinkle it all over your salad. So we're taking in a lot of vegetable oils. And I'm not saying they're bad for you. It's just that we take them too much many of us. And the impact. So uh, it's, I pretty much said it, the increase in type 2 diabetes is also tied to these lipids. Same kinds of problems that are with the fat. The last thing I want to talk about is this issue, and um, it is marketing of food um, and the politics of food. And let me just show you something. This on the left are pictures of McDonald's french fries in the 1970s, the 50s to the 70s, and then down in 2002 at the bottom. Those are single serving packages. The packaging costs more than the potato, and it's cheaper for them to tell you, I'm going to give you extra french fries. It's cheaper than it would be to sell you two of the smaller containers. And so the calorie content in that has gone from 200 to 600 in a single serving. I had my students do an exercise in which they looked at cookbooks in which we have them from many generations, from the 60s and then all the way up to today. The serving size has increased markedly, and the calories on each serving have increased markedly. Plate sizes have increased. So if I look at a plate made by one manufacturer that was done in the 50s, it is significantly smaller than the plates that are made now. So there are all kinds of ways in which things you don't even think about are affecting how much we eat. And think, some of the psychologists have done studies on this. If there is something on your plate, forget about saving it for the kids in Bangladesh. You are not. You're going to finish virtually everything that's on your plate. So it, it, having those larger plates ends up with you eating more. So we've got the basic primate biology. We add the, our ability to process. We have politics. And then you end up with what is on the right there, which is mixed messages. So this is from our US Department of Agriculture. Several years, we had the, the pyramid on the bottom. And that pyramid. As I had a student point this out to me, the small part of the pyramid is the stuff you're supposed to eat the least of. So it's the fatty products. But it's at the top of the pyramid. And that was done in negotiation with agricultural societies. 
because they did not want U.S. Department of Agriculture saying that you should only eat one serving of meat every two or three days. So they have it at the top. Now we're supposed to look at that food bowl on the top, which does not have anything in there, but they still look at the dairy products on the, the left-hand side, the sugars, I guess those are sugars, and it's still rather high. So it's hard to see from that food bowl what you're supposed to eat. And then try to figure out what a serving is, and it's very hard. So we have changed our recommendations. This is Walter Willett, who is a very well-known nutritionist in, in, um, at Harvard University in our country. And he says, they say you really need a high level of proof to change the recommendations. That's quite ironic because they never had a high level of proof just to make them in the first place. So we have recommendations of not eating salt, but if you actually look at the data, there is very little data to support that. And I'm not talking about minerals, so I won't go into that. So what is the last phase of human evolution? I think this is where we are. And I thought a lot about this. And I do not blame anyone for eating at the level that they do, given what we have facing us. On my campus, there are no food machines. You cannot go and get candy bars. You go into a little market, and maybe like your little markets, where you can get seeds and nuts, but it's very hard to find a candy bar. I go over to my sister university, which is San Diego State University, and there are vending machines everywhere because it underwrites the cost. And there are, I see them walking around campus eating hot dogs and eating, you know, drinking, and so I don't blame the individual, I and mean, I honestly do not know what to do about it um, in terms of how do we avoid this? How do you avoid it in your children? And although I don't think it is really the individual's problem, I think the individual is the only one that's gonna make solutions and I think one of them is education in order to educate our children. I know they're starting some of this in, in uh, the South, in the United States, trying to be able to bring some of these children back. Uh, the other is individual decisions of, are you going to make a decision? And when you have children, show them your decisions and then their taste may be different. And then the other one is to really I know many of you, well, all of you, most of you in here care about social issues. Um, you care about your city, you care about what goes on. The other thing is to control the marketing in terms of what gets marketed to children and what gets marketed to us, for that matter, what gets marketed to us and what we're, we assume are good things for us and bad things for us. And I will finish with that, and I want to thank you for your attention. And I'm just showing you a set of names of people I've worked with. I'm very fortunate to have had some very good students, undergraduates and graduates, and who have helped me put all together what you see today. Thank you. I am happy to take any questions. <laughs> and we have a translator back there who said he will translate um, from the Russian if anyone. Yes. Yes. There are so many others about it, and some say that it's very good for the health and it allows you to lose all the and they are say that it's extremely helpful. So she asked me about vegetarianism and that we're told that it's very healthy and that it uh, actually will extend lifespan. And let me tell you a couple of things. We know that under eating extends lifespan. We've raised macaque monkeys over several generations on, con on constricted diets, and they do live longer. We've raised mice, which are farther away from us than a monkey, and we know they live longer. Um, so there are some vegetarian diets you can use, and you actually do lose weight because you're, you're eating a lot more fiber with a vegetarian diet. The other issue is that today, it is not hard to be vegetarian because there is tofu for protein, you can buy tempeh, you can buy lots of things. You can buy canned beans. You do not need to soak and then cook your own beans. 
That was not true when, in, during the time that I'm talking about in terms of our genetics. And so today, vegetarianism makes perfect sense. I, you can get a very well-balanced diet with it, and I think it is probably extend your lifespan by having to, unless you're adding a lot of fat to it. I mean, there are people who eat a lot of cheese because they're on a veg vegetarian diet, and then they're no better off than if you're eating a lot of fatty meat. On the other hand, I don't see that as the natural diet. Not that I think I need to go back to a natural diet. <laughs> and that, I think that's a good point that I should be making. If you go on the online, you're going to see all these paleolithic diets that are going to tell you what to eat. And those are the natural diets, and that's what you're supposed to eat. We also know that red meat does precipitate an inflammatory response in your gut. We, we know that. Now, how much of that then gets translated into some kind of disease state, we don't know. So that link has not been demonstrated. I think that if you're going, if you are going to eat meat, if you keep away from fatty meat, it's probably a better idea. I mean, who can stay away from salami totally, but you know, other than vegetarians? <laughs> um, but it's in constrained amounts. So I think to answer your question more directly, I think vegetarianism is a fine diet. And I actually try to do it several times a week. I do like meat, and I will eat meat. But I have come to recognize that I um, am probably better off eating a lot more vegetables than if I'm eating meat every day. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, two questions, basically. Uh, your thoughts about the book, uh, about the ideas of uh, Richard Pregnum? Yes. Uh, you know him? Uh, yeah. and, and the yes, early... I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah. I saw your article in the same book with uh, Richard. Oh. And um, uh, his idea about the early adaptation of the cooking process. Mm -hmm. And the second question, do you have any, um, I don't know, maybe insights? Uh, in your research you find something and, and you say like, oh, I will use this in my life. Do you have any, any kind of situations like this? Okay. Number one, in terms of cooking and Richard Rangham, the guy is brilliant. I mean, he has, if, if any of you have not read any of his books, definitely read one of his books. We have no in Russian one. Oh, you do? Yes. They're, they're, they're marvelous read. Um, most of them have stimulated more research trying to disprove him because he makes these broad statements, and then there are always things that are wrong with those broad statements. But I will say that his demonic males, his female bonding, his cooking, I, they're phenomenal ideas. And he pulled all that together. So the cooking, in his mind, cooking explains Homo erectus at 1.8 million years ago. Because he says that big brain, you have to have easy access to energy to be able to exist. It had to have cooking. Um, he had all kind or keeping animals away. The only problem is there is absolutely no evidence of fire any earlier than 0.7, 0 .7 million years ago. He has not given up on this. He's convinced there will be evidence, and I can't say that the absence of evidence is evidence of absence. So he could be right. Um, I suspect he's not, but he could be right. But be that as may, when cooking came in, it made a major difference because it broke down foods. And he's right, it even breaks down meat. So tough meat, you stew it, you can eat it. And so he's absolutely right, and he's the first person who really said, you know, humans are the only animal that cook. And you kind of go, uh, yeah. Because <laughs> of course we are, but it was so common, who thought about it? Okay, the second question about, are there things that make me change? One of them had to do with this inflammatory response of red meat. This is a colleague of mine in the medical school, and he works on cell surface sugars that trigger an antibody response. And in humans, those cell surface sugars are quite different than they are in our primate relatives, and that's what triggers our inflammatory response. And he, has, he is um, from Kerala in India, and so he started vegetarian, so it wasn't such a big deal, but he is totally vegetarian. I'm not. But I will say that I'm no longer willing to buy food in those grocery stores, meats. And I never buy hamburger out. I, I will never buy a cooked hamburger out, and I 
I'm very careful about the ground beef that I eat because I am convinced that these factory farms, not only are they horrid for the animal, which I, bothers me, but that's a social issue, um, not only are they um, bad for the animal, but they put so much fat into the meat that I think that it's not good to eat. And so I, I really do focus on pastured meat. And because it is so much more expensive, I don't eat as much of it. So I then start eating other things, which I think are better for me. So that is one of them. I think, in fact, it's combined. And I think reading more about the calorie restriction, um, I do tend to do much more vegetarian eating. So yeah, it did. It did make a difference. The other thing that it made a difference is I didn't talk about the other side of this, which is energy expenditure, other than very briefly here and there. But exercise. You all exercise. You know, I don't think there is a building in the United States where someone would walk up a flight of stairs. They take the elevator or an escalator. And so just the energy you expend coming here is more than most of what Americans do. And you can see it. And so that also. I had a, a student work on energy expenditure in women my age. <laughs> and um, let's say I uh, began my gym being much more. I do a lot more walking. Oh, and there was one in the back. Yeah. Uh, I have several questions. So, like, if there is something like separate eating, uh, is, does it help us to be more healthy? And the second question, how... Wait, what do you mean by separate eating? Like, separate fruits, meats, uh, bread, and don't mix it when we eat uh, in one, like, uh, okay. Uh, and the second question, can we live a healthy eating raw food? There is a lot of people who eat, uh, not cook, uh, and eat just vegetables and raw food. Is it, uh, does it make sense? No, <laughs> it does not make sense. Um, but I'll tell you why, rather than just give you that quick off the cuff. Um, in terms of separate eating, probably not. I mean, once it gets to your gut, you have an acid stomach. And that's, that's something that uh, is different from other, some other animals. Like a cow has a very basic stomach, and that's why it has trouble with corn. Because it, it's, an, it's acid forming, and so it's very difficult for the cow. But we have an acid stomach, and so by the time that stuff gets to your stomach, and especially once it, if it goes through your mouth and you, your saliva gets, starts really working, which is what it does for most people, you're basically starting to break it down and mix it. It's a mush, you know, when it gets to your stomach. If you're talking about separating foods like protein from other things, I don't know. I mean, it might, because if you aren't combining them, you need the nitrogen in the protein, and actually some of that nitrogen goes on as, as the, the carbohydrate and the lipid break down, that carbon backbone can actually bond with the nitrogen for some of the amino acids that you need. So I don't, that part of it I don't know, uh, and I, I wouldn't want to try to venture there, but I think at least in terms of general eating, I don't see it making much difference. Um, in terms of raw food, I, th I know people who say they feel much better after eating raw food and being on it for a while. And it, it could be quite true. I mean, you start, you eat, it's a lot of fiber, and basically it's a colonic cleanser. <laughs> you know, it goes right through you. Um, but that's also part of it. That's part of Richard Reagan's point. It goes right through you. And so trying to maintain body weight on raw food is hard. And for women wanting to have children, it's pretty tough to have enough body weight to produce the milk if you go to nurse or do any of that. So I don't find raw food diets particularly appealing, um, but I know there are people who swear by them. And I am becoming convinced, which I was not for a long time, there really are metabolic differences across us. And we do have different gut microbiota and some people can break down things that other people can't. And we're just starting to look at that. And I think that is one of the more fascinating things we're gonna learn about humans, is that people raised in, on vegetarian diets have a very different gut microflora than those on meat diets. And there have been these studies where they switch them. 
So you take a vegetarian and you put them on something that approximates meat, and you take the meat eater and switch it to vegetarian, and they, their gut microflora changes, and then it goes right back to the original that they got from their mothers, basically. And then they're not able to digest the food at the same amount. So there is a difference. You, you can take mice, which are germ-free, germ-free, they have no microbiota, and they die. You feed, you put, you inject them with a microbiota, and they start gaining weight on the same exact diet. And so there are differences in terms of humans, and it could be that there are humans who will be fine on a, on a, veg, a raw food diet. It, it could be. Yes. I have a question. Um, is it true that uh, the chocolate and ah. sweets are good for brain activity <laughs> and um, for brain work? Are you talking about the study in terms of Nobel Prize winners and chocolate and also? Are you, did you do you know that study? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, it's really interesting. I'm showing the correlation looks quite good. And um, but if you took just normal run-of-the-mill people. I don't know whether it would be a tight correlation or not uh, of eating chocolate and, and increasing brain activity. It's a, it's a fine energy source, and as long as you're not eating too much of it, um, chocolate's a, you know, probably the best food you can eat. I, it's wonderful food. But that study was really something that started many people thinking about chocolate. Um, it was a serious study. But if we took everybody in the room and asked how much chocolate, really monitored how much chocolate, would we see a tight correlation? I don't know. I don't know how much variation we do around the, the uh, regression line. There was a question there. Does that answer you? Yeah. Thanks. Госпожа Владимир, ну считаю несколько негуманным в шесть часов вечера в узкоязычной аудитории постоянно говорить про еду. А перевод? I think I got part of it, but I'm not sure that it's because those those movements are pretty much the same in any language. Поэтому задам два вопроса несколько научно. Госпожа Бардо, вопрос номер один. Раскопками исследования семейства Лики в районе реки Ома, ну видимо стоящего вы знакомы этого семейства миаф Лики. Как раз доказано, что австралоидные, о которых вы говорили в первой части своей лекции, ели исключительно злаковые растения. На самом деле там были обнаружены пробитые черепа павианов. И, собственно, сам Луис Лики доказал о том, что мясо этих павианов являлось в пищу именно теми самыми австралоидными клетками человека. Это мой второй <laughs> um, you were asking about uh, sulfidacines eating meat, and what they have is a delta C13 value. That's all they have. And so that could be interpreted as either grass or meat. If you look at a canal sulfidacine, and of course, there are many people who want them to be eating meat, because that means that our ancestors were already beginning to eat meat. So that's fine. But if you look at those things and the way in which they are built, that is not a meat eater. I'm not saying they wouldn't eat meat now and then. Baboons do. I mean, there will be a baboon hunter that goes and grabs baby antelope when they've been stored by the mother. We know the same thing about capuchin monkeys in the New World. They will take quadamundi pups out of the, their nests and eat them. But doing it on a regular basis, they don't. So it comes in and out of the group. So once the meat-eating baboon, and he never shared with anybody, so when that baboon was gone, meat-eating went away. It's also true of chimpanzees. Chimpanzees do some hunting, and Craig Stanford, who's really written this up uh, on red colobus and chimpanzees, in some sites, chimpanzees really do impact red colobus monkeys and they will hunt. And there's all kinds of debate whether they're hunting as a group, whether they're individuals following one another. But what is known is once those hunters go, that is not passed on. 
So even within the same population, once those hunters die, it is not carried on. And so I'm saying that Australopithecines could have been exactly like that. But in terms of the food being enough to influence the delta C13 value, I find that very hard to believe, if you take in all the rest of what we know about Australopithecines. I mean, that's just, you know, I look at the data one way, and when I think about what is inside that rib cage, that what's inside that rib cage is a big, large intestine. And that does not go along with meat eating. That goes along with a very different kind of adaptation. So I, I don't doubt that they eat meat now and then, but to have it influence the delta C13 value, I, I, think I just find that hard, hard to buy. Oh, was there another one? Okay. Oh, and by the way, I'm glad there's an archaeologist here. <laughs>
that the brain could be bigger. And then you can co-opt that extra brain to do things. But I, don't, I recognize there are problems with that argument too. I mean, why do you grow the brain and then later you decide to do something with it? it it's sort of the argument that Stephen Jay Gould used to use about spandrels, that you have things that come and then you use them for something else. Now, he never argued it for the brain, but I guess that's what I'm saying. The brain is a spandrel. It, it wasn't direct selection. But I would say that question is still open. I'm not ready to dismiss Charles Darwin, though, I, I think. And there, um, 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 I'm blanking on his name. He was at uh, University of Zurich and then went to the Field Museum. He was the one, Bob Martin, Robert Martin. Um, he actually made the argument about the excess energy allowing a larger brain. And I, it just made sense to me, intuitive sense to me. That doesn't mean that it is correct, but um, don't use that curve to support um, selection of brain size, because it isn't there. Yes? One question uh, from Diet Man. <clears throat> What do you think about preservatives or synthetic or um, modified products or foods in Homo sapiens evolution? That's a tough one. <laughs> Preserved foods, and it would be pretty hard to live in this region without preserved foods. And when I think of recent cuisines. I myself don't do that, but I think a lot of that has to do with preserving the energy from the period of time when plants grow. So it, the one I know the best is in Wisconsin, where I used to live, which is a state in the central part of the United States, and it's in up almost to Canada. So you get a sense of what the climate might be like. Most of the people came from uh, Scandinavia, and many of them came from Germany to settle that area. So you had Norwegians, Swedes, you know, Finns, uh, and they were all in that area. Uh, they grew fruits. There were areas up there that actually grew tree fruits, so apples and stuff. So what do you do with them over the winter? Well, you make brandy. It, it takes a lot of energy and puts it in a small space, and it's not going to rot. And so Wisconsin ended up having the highest per capita intake of brandy of any state in the United States. And I think it had to do with preserving food. Now, you know, there are other ways of doing it. You pickle it, you do all those sorts of things with it. Um, but I think that in many parts of the world, you have to preserve food. Otherwise, you're not going to have food to, for a whole year. Now, in terms of how it does for human health, and this is not anything I had anything to do with, and I just know it because I like to read about food, is um, that at least in China, there seems to be a real association between eating a lot of pickled food and throat cancers. And part of that is the way in which the pickle, of uh, using a, a lye-like material to do their pickling. And I can see why they pickle, um, but that is not good for them. In terms of, you mentioned modified foods. I wasn't sure if you meant genetically modified or other kinds of Preserving, you mean instead of genetic modification, right? I think you probably did. But anyway, that's about what I know about preserving. The one I think would be the most fascinating one to figure out is olive. Like, how did you ever figure out how to make an olive? I, I could see preserving apples, because you eat them. I could see preserving lots of other things because you can eat them in the fresh state, but an olive you can't eat until it is pickled because you, you have to remove the real acidity in order to take it out, to be able to eat it. So somebody asked me once about olives, and I have been wondering about that since. So if anybody ever wants to do a study on where did olives, the history of olive making, I think that would be a good one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay. You think that's it? Well, thank you. I appreciate the attention. Наше мероприятие подходит к концу. Спасибо всем, кто пришел.
И я бы хотел от лица проекта «Открытое пространство» высказать несколько слов благодарности, во-первых, нашим замечательным ученым, нашим гостям, которые прочитали нам две отличные лекции. Давайте еще раз поаплодируем. Также хотелось бы поблагодарить наших партнеров и друзей школы «Ревная», по приглашению которых вот все это мероприятие и случилось. Большое вам спасибо. Ну и также хочу вам сказать, что проект «Открытое пространство» готовит для вас новые мероприятия, новые лекции, ближайшие из которых состоится уже 19 октября, в субботу. Ну, пусть пока для вас будет маленьким сюрпризом, что это будет за лекция. Следите за нашими анонсами, следите за нами в Фейсбуке, ВКонтакте и на нашей странице на сайте Школы Летная. Спасибо за внимание, спасибо, что пришли. Всего самого хорошего.